I'm Norman Askins. I'm an architect and architectural historian based here in Atlanta. I wanted to welcome you to the ICAA Classical City Guide. What better way to start than in this historic downtown region, the thriving commercial hub of the city? Let's start with Atlanta's oldest standing skyscraper. Built in 1897, the original called the English American Building. These days, it's known as the Flatiron Building. Interestingly, it predates New York's Flatiron Building by four years. This 11-story skyscraper is certainly an icon. A few blocks south takes us to 35 Broad Street and the first of many buildings by Philip Trammell Schutze. Built in 1901, the original building was designed by architect Thomas Henry Morgan. However, it was the renovation undertaken by Schutze in 1929 that elevated this building to a true masterpiece. He stripped the base of the building back to the steel frame and completely redesigned the lower three levels. In the Corning arched bays and bold rustication, one can clearly see how Schutze was inspired by the Italian mannerism. If we travel a few blocks south, we come across a building that is strikingly different, but no less handsome, the Martin Luther King Jr. Federal Building and Post Office Annex. Built during the worst years of the Depression, this megalithic structure designed by local architect A. Ten Eck Brown is an excellent example of minimal classicism. As with any classical building, there's always something for the eye to discover. As one approaches the building, beautiful carvings reveal themselves. Of course, not everything needs to be quite so monumental in scale. The more modestly sized Carnegie Education Pavilion in downtown Hardy Ivy Park. This marble Beaux-Arts monument was constructed from the exterior of Atlanta's first truly public library, the Carnegie Library. Thankfully, the old library's architecture base were preserved following the building's demolition, and 20 years later, they were repurposed by architect Henry Hover to create this pavilion. A little west of downtown takes us to a prime example of an affluent early 20th century Atlanta dwelling, the Herndon home. This home is both architecturally and historically extraordinary. Its owner, Alonzo Herndon, was born into slavery and went on to become Atlanta's wealthiest black citizen, due entirely to his hard work and entrepreneurial spirit. With his wife, Adrienne McNeil Herndon, who was an actress in Boston, built a fine home fitting for a couple of their status in the early 20th century. Remarkably, rather than turning to a fashionable architect at the time, the home is thought to be designed by Adrienne herself, with Alonzo acting as general contractor and construction performed exclusively by African-American craftsmen. The result is a fine revival home adorned with the Corinthian columns and featuring stunning Rococo interiors. Here we are in Midtown Atlanta at the very famous intersection, the corner of Peachtree Street running north-south and to my left of Ponce Leon Avenue, that's how we say it in Atlanta. Immediately behind me is Atlanta's first luxury high-rise, known originally as the Ponce Leon Apartments and now known as the Ponce Condominium. Built in 1913, the Ponce Condominium was one of the first buildings in Atlanta to show that luxury living could be done in close quarters. The front facade gently curves around the southeast corner of Ponce Leon Avenue and features a two-story high colonnade with six paired and six single Tuscan columns stretching from tower to tower. It was designed by William Stoddard, a New York architect who'd worked all over the East Coast, though it was the South where he truly made his mark. In fact, one needs only to turn the head across the street to another Beaux-Arts masterpiece by William Sauter, the Georgian Terrace Hotel, 
completed a few years before the Ponce in 1911 and intended to be the southern interpretation of a Parisian hotel. Built from brick, marble, and limestone, the hotel features, like the Ponce condominium, both paired and single Tuscan columns. Distinctive turreted corners jut proudly out into the intersection. Markedly different from the Beaux-Arts styling of the Georgia Terrace Hotel in the Ponce, the Fox Theater was originally conceived as a home for Atlanta's Shriners organization who looked to the ancient temples of the East to inspire their buildings. With soaring domes, minarets, and sweeping balconies, the influence of Islamic and Egyptian architecture were immediately apparent. Such was the scope of the original building that it became financially untenable for the Shriners, and it was leased to William Fox, who turned it into a theater, or what they would have called in that day a movie palace. Inside, the auditorium replicates an Arabian courtyard complete with night sky full of stars. Moving a little further north takes us to another beautiful Shotzi building, the Temple Synagogue. Shotzi masterfully blends classical design with religious motifs. Finished in 1931, the well-proportioned building features a pedimented portico, ionic columns, drum dome, and vaulted and dome sanctuary. Of particular note is the intricate plaster work on the interiors of the sanctuary's frieze, cornice, vaults, and dome. To the northeast of Midtown, we come to yet another fabulous Schutze work, the Villa Apartments, built around 1920. The front of the 25-unit apartment is modeled after the entry of St. Cecilia in Rome. It is a quintessential Beaux-Arts building featuring many hallmarks of that style, such as the symmetrical facade with paired columns flanking a round arched opening, masonry walls, coins, and carved and decorated garlands. Interesting to note, is that the building, when originally built, was actually designed for young bachelors, which, when I was in college, I tried to rent, but that didn't work out. They didn't want college students. As we continue north along Peachtree Road, as it winds through Atlanta, we get to Buckhead, the uptown commercial and residential district of Atlanta. I can't think of any better place to start our investigation of Buckhead than Atlanta's iconic Swan House. It was built in 1928 by Edward and Emily Inman. This masterpiece was designed by Schutze and the interiors were decorated by Ruby Ross Wood of New York. The west facade or the rear facade is perfectly symmetrical with a double winding staircase leading to a central doorway. Heavily framed, the door features a segmented pediment supported by scroll brackets. The garden leading up to the west facade with its dramatic terrace lawn is modeled after Villa Corsini in Rome, the perfect accompaniment to a design that is strictly Italian in derivation. This is in marked contrast to the east facade at the front of the house, which with its four columned portico is English Palladian in its influence. The interior of the house is as elaborate as the exterior, and the keen-eyed visitor will notice the reoccurring swan motif throughout. Just a year after the swan house was complete, Schutze was already working on another spectacular residence in the Buckhead region, the May Patterson Goodrum House, completed in 1930. Given that Chelsea was likely given free reign over the design of the house and surrounding landscape, it is not surprising that he considered it his most favorite house. Broadly influenced by English Regency style, the front facade has a modest semicircular portico featuring four ionic columns framing the front door's distinctive bright red front entrance. Plaster swags decorate the entrance and above sits a Palladian window framed by wrought iron balustrade. Delicate color schemes soften the overall appearance. The Regency style continues inside. The dining room famously features an elaborate mural by Schutze's friend and American Academy fellow muralist Alan Cox. Painted in New York before being shipped to Atlanta, it depicts Chinese figures on parade inspired by similar work in the Royal Pavilion at Brighton. 
Both the Swan and Goodrum houses are open to visitors. However, there is another of Shutsey's grand residences in the area that is remarkable for the exact opposite reason. The Calhoun Estate remains a family home, privately owned and lovingly cared for by its current owners, who were only the third family to own the property since it was completed in 1923. Both Shotzi and Neil Reed had a hand in the design of this Italian Baroque masterpiece, which is often referred to in Atlanta as the Pink Palace. The home features all the hallmarks of 1920's Southern Mansion, a ballroom that evokes Gone with the Wind, Italianate masonry, and beautifully carved wooden doors and ceiling. While it is fabulous to see these houses up close, it is also remarkable to step back and see them in context. All of these houses can be found in the neighborhoods known as Peachtree Heights West, which was designed in 1910 by the New York architectural firm of Carrera and Hastings, who are perhaps better known for projects like the New York Public Library. Peachtree Heights is notable for being the only subdivision designed by the firm, as well as their only project in Atlanta. I'm here at Emory University campus, part of Druid Hills, just east of downtown Atlanta. In 1915, Henry Hornbustle, an architect from Pittsburgh, was hired to do the campus plan, and he chose to make this the quadrangle, which would be the centerpiece of the entire campus complex. And over the past hundred years, many architects from different cities have been asked to design buildings here, and they all had the good sense to keep Hornbustle's architectural language which results in a very cohesive campus. One of the most interesting recent renovations, which delightfully continues the tradition established by Hornbustle, stands behind me. It was originally a law school building designed by Hornbustle in 1916. In 1985, noted postmodernist Michael Grave was commissioned to renovate the interiors so that the Emory College Museum collection could be moved into the building. Later, in 1993, Graves was called on again to renovate and expand the exterior of the building to create what is now known as the Michael C. Carlos Museum. Inside the museum's elegant design highlights works of art without overpowering them. It is a stunning example of how a knowledgeable postmodern designer can use classical precedent to create beautiful and contextual buildings. It seems only inevitable that we should end this video with another one of Shotzi's most brilliant works, The Little Chapel at Glen Memorial Church. Seating only 75 people is small but extremely impressive. The interior of the chapel replicates on a small scale the interior of St. Stephen Walbrook in London, considered one of Sir Christopher Wren's masterpieces. The beautifully carved woodwork was done by H.J. Millard and includes motifs taken from local Georgia landscape, pine cones, peaches, and magnolias. With such a beautiful context to respond to, contemporary architects and designers are continuing the tradition of classical design in Atlanta and indeed across the Southeast. Every year, the Institute of Classical Architecture and Arts Southeast Chapter recognizes local talent with their annual awards, which are aptly named the Philip Trammell Schutze Awards. The homes, churches, gardens, and civic institutions which have won Schutze Awards over the years are all worthy additions to our beautiful city, which will no doubt stand the test of time. As we conclude this video, I want to stress that this is by no means a definitive list of all the great buildings in Atlanta. Many more lurking out there for you to discover on your own.